OK, so um, thank you for everyone coming. Uh, my name is uh, Xiaoyan Wang, and today will be a joint talk joined by me and my colleague Jonathan. So the idea is to use um, both of our expertise to cover different areas or different topics in deep learning. OK, so uh, yeah, hi, I'm Jonathan. And um, so within this presentation, we are going to be talking about a range of topics. Uh, we will first begin with a brief overview of machine learning and then we'll move on to general deep learning and from here we will then dive into our, our advanced topics that we have picked out. Uh, these are things that Xiaoyang and I are personally interested in. So this is so this is going to be by no means an exhaustive list. Uh, there are many other areas that are super interesting. Uh, but we are going to talk about cooperative multi-agent right. reinforcement learning. Uh, then we will move on to Xiao Yang's material, where she will talk about self-supervised learning, firstly, and then move on to graph neural networks. Due to our limited time and the amount of material which is in these areas, uh, we shall focus on intuitions and she'll give uh, uh, references to relevant literature throughout. So firstly, I thought I'd begin by defining machine learning as a stepping stone to engaging in topics in deep learning. So machine learning is concerned loosely with equipping machines with the capability to learn from data. In contrast to rule-based systems, where it explicitly defined program behaviors, machine learning affords greater flexibility and allows important features and patterns to be distilled directly from data. This is an important skill, as with some problems, it can be difficult to explicitly identify a set of rules that would provide a comp would be comprehensive and deal with all edge cases. For a more comprehensive definition of machine learning, I quite like this definition from uh, Professor Tim Mitch uh, Tom Mitchell. So, a computer program is said to learn from experience with respect to some class of tasks and perform and a performance measure. If its performance at the tasks as measured by the performance measure improves with experience E. The general idea being that you know, as you expose an, uh, an algorithm to more data, if it improves with experience, it's, it's learning somehow. So machine learning itself can be broken down into three areas where the major difference is the level of supervision. So firstly, uh, supervised learning. This generally considers a label data set containing a feature vector X and a label Y. For example, if we want to do image classification, the feature vector could be an image and the label could be a cat or dog, for example. Alternatively, if we want to do a regression task like traffic prediction, our feature vector might be the traffic levels of some time and our label may be the traffic at some later time step. Within this paradigm, uh, within this general paradigm of supersized learning, our task is to produce a model such that the label can be predicted from the feature vector. Secondly, super unsupervised learning. Uh, this considers a data set comprising exclusively of feature vectors. In this domain, we may be interested in doing clustering, uh, density estimation, or something like uh, dimensionality reduction. Within dimensionality reduction, for example, we are interested in reducing the dimension of the data while still preserving as much information as possible. This can be useful when we want to produce visualizations, for example. And finally, uh, we move on to uh, reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is generally concerned with sequential decision-making tasks. For example, um, in things like games, uh, like chess, like Atari, things like that. In this paradigm, we generally have access to a reward function and our task is to find a strategy within uh, the problem such that we can maximize our experience of this reward. If we were playing Mario, we would be interested in learning a strategy that maximizes the reward that we receive. Over the past decade or so, there's been a noticeable shift towards deep learning within machine learning. Deep relearning generally refers to the utilization of deep neural networks, which have proved to be incredibly powerful as function approximators, achieving state-of-the-art performance in a range of domains, including natural language processing, image classification, gameplay, among many others. So again, let's begin with the de uh, definition. Uh, so deep learning is a kind of machine learning that achieves great power and flexibility by representing the world as a nested hierarchy of concepts, with each concept defined in terms of simpler concepts. To further explain uh, this, uh, with the support of an illustration, let's consider the deep uh, neural network that is shown at the bottom of the page. This is what is known as a convolutional neural network is one is the, and is one of the major breakthroughs that enabled a state-of-the-art performance in image domains. Uh, this specific deep neural network um, is taken uh, from human level control through deep reinforcement learning, uh, which is uh, one of the, well, I suppose, seminal papers in deep reinforcement learning. So as I said, this is what's uh, known as a convolutional neural network and it is um, 
So, oop. So as the network trains in each layer, it will learn to identify uh, features which are important. By a layer, I mean for this be a layer, this be a layer, this be a layer, where each layer builds its representations in terms of the features that previous layers have learned. So in the first layer, we may learn to identify lines and edges. In the second layer, it'll be collections of edges which may form shapes and so on and so forth. And this is how this is part of the reason that uh, deep learning is quite powerful because of the sort of ability to build up abstract ideas and concepts out of simpler concepts. So now we are going to move on to our first uh, subtopic, that being cooperative multi-agent reinforcement learning. So in this domain, we are interested in getting groups of agents or robots um, to work together in order to accomplish some task. So before we jump into that, I thought I'd just give a brief overview of uh, reinforcement learning in a little bit more detail than I gave previously. So as I previously stated, RL is a branch of machine learning that typically considers problems that require sequential decision making within an unknown environment. Problems are usually models as what's known as a Markov decision process, a model of which is shown on the left. Just to talk you through this diagram, an agent observes a state, then selects an action and then transitions to a new state and receives a reward. The goal of the agent is to find a mapping from states uh, to actions uh, such that the expected cumulative reward it receives is maximized. The agent begins with no understanding of the environment and it is required to learn what actions are good and what are bad. And it does this through a trial and error like process within which it attempts to learn uh, what information contained in the state may give some indication to what is the correct action to select. To give you a more concrete example of this, let's consider a humanoid robot that is trying to learn how to walk. It is presented with a reward that is proportional to the distance it tra travels. It begins with no understanding on how to correctly use its legs to walk. On its first attempt, it will try a number of random actions and will probably just flail around. Over many episodes and attempts, it is likely to eventually find behaviors that allow it to walk. It, um, you know, it'll fall forward maybe, and it'll learn that by falling forward, it can move forward, and then eventually by um, you know, connecting together these behaviors, it'll eventually end up with a, a policy that look like uh, walking. So if you haven't done so previously, I'd recommend looking at some of these, uh, some of the policies that these agents um, learn on YouTube, as they are quite entertaining. Okay, so uh, just as an example of some of the work that Xiaoyang and I have done in uh, just general uh, reinforcement learning. Um, so this paper is uh, one that we collaborated on and is work concerned with uh, RUDC, uh, RUDU um, resource assignment problem within a ORAN network, which we cast as a bin packing problem. We then apply a self-play reinforcement learning approach to it in a way that is similar to neural uh, Monte Carlo tree search algorithm that was utilized in AlphaGo. Uh, within the associated paper, we demonstrate improved performance over a range of baselines. Um, yeah, uh, we'd be happy to talk about the paper in more detail at another time, but yeah, um, we'll continue. So I thought I'd move, now move on to uh, motivating why I think multi-agent reinforcement learning is important. Uh, so I think it's important as a large number of real world applications will involve situations where autonomous agents may interact. A clear example of this is things like autonomous uh, vehicles, where coordination between uh, vehicles may be important for traffic management, uh, for example. So naturally, we need to consider how to promote and enable cooperation between agents. And this is um, you know, an important research challenge. Uh, this um, Another example of some work that uh, has come out of the NUCDI con uh, consortium is some work that I did in collaboration with partners at Cambridge, where we looked at casting a network maintenance uh, problem as a multi-agent reinforcement learning problem, where effectively we allow for decentralized um, decisions about maintenance actions in a communications network. So I, I now want to talk about some of the issues of collaborating in multi-agent reinforcement learning especially when we're interested in potentially interacting with a large number of other agents. So let's just consider uh, this task on um, the slide here. Um, this is what's known as a referential game and is a game which mandates the learning of a language between two agents. 
So in this setup, there's two agents, a speaker and a listener, uh, both of which observe an image. In this case, um, uh, the images are taken from the MDIS dataset, which if you're not familiar with, is a dataset comprising of handwritten uh, digits. So uh, the speaker will observe a an image and it is tasked with finding a method to communicate the identity of that uh, image to the listener. The listener then observes its own image and is tasked with performing some kind of numerical computation with both images, for example, something like addition. If it gets it right, the agents will receive a reward of one, otherwise they'll receive a reward of zero. So in order for the agents to complete this task, they must come up with a mutually understood language which communicates the identity of the speaker's observation with high fidelity. And the listener needs to learn the operation that's required and to be able to identify its own digit. So an interesting experiment to consider in this uh, paradigm is, um, so what happens if we train uh, two pairs of speakers and listeners and change their partners? So speaker A is with listener B and speaker uh, B is with listener A. Um, so will their languages be compatible? Um, in general, the answer is uh, no. The reason being that the mapping from the speaker's observation to the message will be um, you know, completely arbitrary or just whatever convention they've agreed on. Uh, just to give a more human example of this, if Xiaoyang and I decided that we were going to call cats dogs and dogs cats, there is nothing, nothing stopping us from doing that. Uh, we'll be very confused, but it's completely plausible and it would be a, um, you know, an efficient way for us to communicate information between us. This is generally why this can be, um, you know, this can be an issue. These are sometimes referred to as um, idiosyncratic conventions, which are just highly specialized conventions that occur uh, that uh, arise between uh, two agents. So uh, the general idea is um, this general idea is something that we considered in the paper shown on the right. In this paper, we consider interactions between pair of established speakers of languages and uh, listeners and observe uh, that a phenomenon called catastrophic forgetting can occur when you train change these partners. Effectively, when I learn to adapt to a new agent, that represents a data distribution shift, and then I can forget my previously established language. So we just, uh, in this paper, we, uh, we propose a simple methodology to overcome this, and I'd yeah, welcome you to have a look at this paper if you find that interesting. Okay, so, um, so what I mentioned on the previous slide, an example of a situation where highly specialized conventions can arise between agents. Um, these conventions can be problematic as they make it hard to generalize to new partners. An area that deals with this general challenge is a zero shot coordination, where this is defined as follows. So it considers situations where agents are placed in cooperative situations <laughs> with novel partners and must quickly coordinate. Um, so why this may be important is um, if there's like a, I don't know, a robot assistant or something, it may only get one chance to collaborate, uh, cooperate with a human user of the system. So it must quickly adapt to that human. Uh, otherwise, it may not get another chance. Um, so a cool uh, approach to this problem is presented in a paper by a, a Strauss et al called Collaborating with Humans Without Human Data. Uh, this was at the most recent, recent uh, NeurIPS conference and was on the Spotlight papers. Uh, so in this paper, um, they do not consider language, but they do consider a task that requires collaboration in a cooking task where they want to extend to novel partners. As the title suggests, they're specifically interested in collaborating with humans without requiring the expensive collection of human data. They overcome this with a method called fictitious co-play, which is an adaptation of something from the general, more comp competitive self-play setup. In this uh, algorithm, they note that to overcome reliance on human data, they need to represent the distribution over strategies and competencies which humans have. They do this by training a population of virus strategy called self-play and periodically checkpoint them. Um, this achieves this distribution over strategies and competencies, which we're interested in if we want to collaborate with humans. As we mentioned earlier in the language example, um, 
these agents, these this training comes up with highly specialized conventions, but they do they tend to exploit this for this distribution. So within their experimentation, they demonstrate that this methodology cooperates well with human players, which is really cool and demonst a demonstration of progress on a key end objective within AI, which is to be able to collaborate in a zero shot setting with uh, humans or other uh, entities. So I'm now going to uh, hand over to Xiaoyang. So moving away from the uh, cooperation in reinforcement learning, I will talk about uh, another concept in machine learning that is uh, self-supervised learning. So um, at the beginning of this talk, we have put machine learning algorithms into three categories, depending on the level of supervision. So uh, for example, in supervised learning, we have data as well as labels. So labels are existing external supervisory signals um, that might be uh, manually annotated by human or some kind of computer programs. Um, but in the concept of self-supervised learning, we talk about another kind of supervisory signals. That is to construct some kind of tasks from the data itself. We call it uh, pretext tasks. Well, um, they are not the real tasks we are trying to solve, but we can use these uh, auxiliary signals to learn embeddings of the input data. So, um, or we say we learn um, better representations of the data. So these embeddings can then be used to all sorts of different downstream tasks, including, uh, for example, classification, that is a kind of super, uh, supervised learning task, or clustering, that is a kind of unsupervised learning task, and much more. So um, what is uh, self-supervised learning? Um, the uh, definition is that self-supervised learning is to obtain labels from the data itself by using a semi-automatic process. Um, essentially, what it does is to predict part of the data from other parts. So um, then we need to think, why do we move from supervised le learning to self-supervised learning? Um, since supervised learning has already worked pretty well in some of the uh, applications. So there are um, mainly three reasons. First, because labels are expensive. Let's take the uh, groundbreaking ImageNet dataset as an example. In this dataset, they have 1,000 classes uh, containing 1.3 million labeled images, and these labels are annotated by human. That is very time consuming and expensive. So um, the second reason is about the generalization. So in supervised learning, we always talk about the problem of generalization on out of distribution samples. People use different approaches to tackle this problem, for example, to develop uh, new neural network architectures or simply to use larger data set to put more samples in, uh, in distribution rather than out of distribution. So self-supervised learning is another way to uh, tackle the generalization problem. Um, the third reason being that because supervised learning is highly dependent on the labels. So if adversarial attack, attack happens in labels, the performance of supervised model will drop um, dramatically. Uh, because of these reasons, the community of machine learning has thinking about moving from human supervision to data self-supervision. So um, on the bottom right, there is a figure showing a number of publications and, and citations on self-supervised learning during the past years. OK, so um, this is the general concept of self-supervised learning. So in terms of specific method, I will show several examples explaining first um, how to build the task and second, how to learn from them. Um, the first category is uh, generative methods. Um, we take the natural language processing as an, as an example. So um, we already have existing data for sentences. So what we do here is to, for example, for a given um, input sentence, we simply mask out some of the words and we learn a neural network to predict what is missing in there. Because we already know what is a word we have masked out. So um, this can be trained in a supervised way, but do not require external signal. So here in the generative method, the task would be reconstruct part of the input from the corrupted um, input. Uh, this model is called BERT, and it's very, a very common model in natural language processing. It ha has already been deployed to some of the online translation systems. 
Another category is uh, contrastive methods. So here, the uh, task is slightly different. The task is to maximize agreement between differently augmented views of the same data. For example, we are given a, an image and we can do, um, for example, color tutoring, um, edge enhancement or some rotation on this image. But essentially, they are the same image. So we should be able to find uh, a representation that has maximum agreement between the different views of the same image. And at the same time, we can minimize the agreement between the augmentations of different images. That's why we call it contrastive method. So here's an um, example using contrastive self-supervised learning for wireless power control. So um, we consider a wireless network with N transmitter receiver pairs here. Um, here, each transmitter intends to uh, send a message to its corresponding receiver. Assume that a transmission occurs using the same time and frequency resource. That means uh, simultaneously do two transmissions will have interference. So in this case, we want to maximize the sum throughput by adjusting the power of the transmitters. And we train a neural network to do it. Uh, one of the traditional approaches using neural network to do this is to, to do it in a supervised uh, manner. So starting from the input, which is the channel matrix, and uh, the labels will be the power control vectors calculated by some other methods. Um, so doing this in a supervised learning way will require first to calculate a lot of, uh, to, to collect a lot of samples of um, channel matrix, uh, channel matrix and the power control vector because we need a lot of them to build a data set. So a more efficient way proposed in this paper is to first apply contrastive self-supervised learning on the channel matrix and then we can have an embedding. Then this embedding would be a better representation of the channel matrix. So by having that, uh, we can achieve better performance with less label uh, with less labels. The, the, so the whole point is to learn a better represent representation and given a small amount of labels, we can achieve better result. And we're also exploring the possibility of using self-supervised learning as a pre-training step for reinforcement learning. Okay. Let's move on to another topic that is a graph neural network and uh, that that represents a different type of data. So um, graph uh, graph structure is very common in a lot of real world applications. Uh, for example, we have social network, we have communication network that is, is essentially a graph and we have molecules. Um, the, the common features are they are all defined by nodes and the connections between nodes. What we care about in a graph is the feature of nodes and the connection status. However, the current machine learning methods we use for images, videos, or languages cannot be directly applied to graphs because, of they, ha the, because they have a different structure. So graph neural networks is a way to adapt existing machine learning methods directly to uh, process non-Euclidean structure data. Here we mean graph. So mathematically, a graph can be seen as um, a tuple of vertices and edges. And what we are trying to do here is to learn a representation from the graph, graph which can capture the node features as well as the connection status of the graph. And then the, this embedding can be used for different other tasks. For example, we can do uh, node classification like user uh, classification in social networks or we can do link prediction, that is edge level, or we can do uh, molecular classification, that is graph level. So how do we actually do it? Uh, in graph neural networks, uh, it presents a way to aggregate information from neighbor nodes. For example, in this graph, if we look at node A, it has three neighbors. So in the first layer, we collect information from the three um, neighborhood labels. And if we, if we go one more step beyond that, for each of its neighbor nodes, it also has its own neighbors. So by this way, we can pass the mes message layer by layer. So at the end, we can have a better uh, aggregation of the information. Um, so in graph neural network, um, the way to aggregate information is first averaging the information from its neighbors, a simple average. And then we apply a neural network, which is weights and biases on top of that. That will give us trainable parameters. So this is just one structure. Um, 
a more advanced version is called graph convolutional networks. Um, in graph convolutional networks, it has a slightly different normalization method when we do the information average, and also it has a slightly different uh, neural network architecture, but essentially um, they're doing the same two steps. Okay, this is a use case, and this is work that is going on in our group. So we're trying to uh, apply the uh, graph structure to a ORAN network because the network connection is essentially a graph st uh, structure. It's more natural to model it this way. And we're trying to develop reinforcement learning methods for uh, the IUD association task uh, in this graph. So the idea is we want to model this structure as a graph, and we want to apply reinforcement learning on top of that to solve some of the uh, uh, applications. Another use case uh, we're also considering is the handover management using graph reinforcement learning. Okay. Hi, uh, so today uh, we've talked about uh, cooperative multi-agent reinforcement learning, uh, self-supervised learning, and uh, graph neural networks. I do hope you found that interesting and we'll now welcome any questions.